So we'll start. Okay, first, um, I'd like to make some uh, links with what Laurent said to us. Um, so, and first, uh, I start with a definition. Whoops. La. So we've seen yesterday that when you take the function, which is the distance from a fixed point, the gradient has norm one outside of the cut locus. So we'll make that a definition. So a distance function is a smooth function f, so well, u, let's say u, from, let's say, it doesn't need to be defined on the whole manifold, but let's say some open set inside the, the manifold 2R, such that so the gradient of u as norm 1. Uh, so our first example is the distance to a point, but actually it also works with distance uh, from some fixed submanifold. And it, we will see some example where actually the, what we will be interested in is some kind of distance to infinity function. Uh, OK, but this has some really nice properties. So let's set S sub t be the set of points in M <coughs> such that um, uh, such that u of p is equal to t. So these are the level sets of u. These are so the gradient is never zero. So these are smooth hypersurfaces in my manifold. And there will have some uh, there will be some interesting relation between the surface, the hypersurface, and the function u. So well some facts. You can take them as exercises if you want. Uh, first fact, which has nothing to do with these hypersurfaces st. Uh, the integral curves of gradient u are geodesics. So what that says actually is that d nabla u nabla u is equal to zero which is pretty easy to check from there. Uh, second, the Hessian of u is actually when you restrict it to the tangent space to that, which is the orthogonal to the gradient. The gradient is a normal vector field to this guy. So the Hessian of u is the second fundamental form of the hypersurface ST. And um, so you have to be a bit careful. Uh, so if I want to respect the convention of Laurent, 1 over n minus 1 times the Laplacian of u is the mean curvature
of uh, st. OK, and just like the distance function to a point where in exponential coordinate we had a nice expression for the metric, here you can do something similar. So, so pick t0 such that uh, u of p, some point p, equal t0. So then you have your hypersurface s t0. Uh, you have, so the gradient of u looks like that. And you can build, um, you can build some kind of coordinate system on, on a neighborhood of ST0 in the following way. So let's say, so this will be defined on ST0 times some small interval, say. And this will go to M. And to some point P on epsilon on the surface N epsilon, I map that to, so let me keep the same notation as yesterday, C, uh, well, no, let's call that S maybe, C S times gradient U uh, at time one. Well, that would, yeah, maybe that's clearer to say C gradient U at time S. So what is this map? This map is you start at some point on your manifold, on your hypersurface. So here you have a preferred direction. Follow it for time S along a geodesic. And this will give you another point, something which is easy to check is that at least for small s, so, so let's say here I have traveled for time s along each of the geodesics. So here what I get is, so maybe let's give some name to this map, big F. So here what I get is big F take every point on st0 and travel for time s. And it's not too hard to show that, so you look at how u moves along this gradient curve, and it's not too hard to show that it's actually s t0 plus s. So, so you have a nice foliation of your manifold by those level hypersurfaces and a nice parametrization. And actually, uh, so I have F, here I have my metric G. I can look at what the metric look like here. And this is a generalization. So this is sometimes called the normal exponential to the submanifold. And if I look at how my uh, metric behave in this coordinate. So it will have this form. H S. So and this will be uh, the, the metric on S sub well, T naught plus S induced uh, by my metric G. And once again, when you take the lead derivative of that guy, you get the Hessian, you will get the Hessian of U, and that will tell you how this guy moves. So, well, basically this is, and the, this is just another way of saying that the second fundamental form tells you how the surface moves when you push it a little bit along normal directions. Okay, so 
maybe let's try to prove a theorem from all this Riemannian geometry that I told you. So which is not the core of what I want to say, but is nevertheless a really nice theorem. So this is a theorem by Lichnerovich. I hope I'm not making any misspelling here, and Obata. And it tells you that <coughs> lower bounds on the Ricci curvature, at least if they are positive, have strong implications on the spectrum of the Laplacian, so the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So, assume Mn G is complete, or actually compact, that comes for free here. We'll see why later. Uh, we'll see why here complete would be enough. So assume Mng is compact, and the Ricci curvature of G is bounded from below by n minus 1 times G. So it's more curved than the sphere. And let lambda in R plus be such that this is an eigenvalue of the Laplacian. So there are competing teams in that. Uh, so I'll write it this way so that the eigenvalues are positive. So I'm put an opposite sign on the Laplacian, but that's <coughs> no big deal. Then lambda, so that's for some smooth function f. So then this eigenvalue here of the Laplacian is bigger than n. And if lambda is equal to n, then mn is actually isometric to so the standard sphere. So here we have a comparison result. So we, based on an assumption on the curvature, we can say something on some other geometric invariant, which is here the lowest eigenvalue of the Laplacian. We can compare it to the lowest eigenvalue of the sphere. And uh, based on that, and we have a rigidity phenomenon. So if we are just at the lowest eigenvalue of the sphere, so the lowest eigenvalue of the sphere is n, then we are actually uh, isometric to the sphere. So this is, so in Sylvain's course, this kind of uh, wiggling equal will mean homeomorphic or diffeomorphic. Here it's isometric. Uh, okay, so not sure I'll do the whole proof. But let's start, at least. Uh, proof. So the proof relies on this last formula I gave you, the Buckner formula for the Laplacian and the gradient of a function. So recall that 1 half of uh, the Laplacian of the gradient of f squared is equal to the following thing. So Laplace, no, gradient of the Laplacian of f, gradient of f, uh, plus the norm of the Hessian of f squared, plus Ricci of gradient f, gradient f. So we are on a compact manifold. Uh, we'll integrate this equality. So when we integrate, so we assume here that uh, Laplace f is equal to minus lambda f. And we will try to say something about lambda. Yes? Uh, why? Uh, yeah, uh, non-identically zero, yeah, thank you. 
Uh, not constant, actually, on a compact manifold without boundary. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, OK. So, OK, we assume this. So let's, so we start with this formula. We integrate that over M with respect to the Riemannian measure. So like in Rn, uh, so this is compactly supported. When you integrate to Laplacian, you get nothing. So 0. And here, we'll see what we do. It's equal to the integral of M, gradient of the Laplacian of F, gradient of F, plus Hessian of F squared plus Ricci of gradient f, gradient f. And I integrate with respect to the Riemannian measure. OK, so this is minus lambda f. That's good. Uh, and the rest, we will see what we do. So I'll write that, and I put this term here. So I will get that lambda times the integral of gradient f squared dvg. Um, and here, yeah, I will do that right now. Here, I will use the lower bound on the Ricci curvature. So this is, so Ricci is greater than so where is my hypothesis? Here. Ricci is greater than n minus 1 g. So this is greater than n minus 1 times gradient f squared. OK, so this will be greater than the integral of m of the Hessian of f squared plus n minus 1, yeah, I did it, the good, yeah, times uh, gradient f squared, dvg. OK. So now we need to take care of that Hessian term. So we would actually already get here by putting that here, that this guy will obviously be non-negative. So we will get lambda minus n minus 1 times the integral of gradient f squared is greater than 0. So lambda is greater than n minus 1. But actually, we can take care of this Hessian to get the optimal inequality. Uh, OK, how will we do that? So well, we know a lot of stuff about the Laplacian. Oh, I didn't tell you yesterday. The Laplacian, so I define it in some way. We can define it in another way. And it will actually be the trace of the Hessian. Uh, so the trace of the Hessian, the Laplacian, we can write something. So I will decompose this bilinear form between its trace-free part and some multiple of the metric. And that will give me the following identity. So here, I will have, so this is the trace free part. And then, well, I get uh, 1 over n Laplace f g squared. So I've just said that uh, trace free matrices and the identity matrix are orthogonal for the usual scalar product. So, OK, let me keep that and do one more. One more computation. So I keep this part and here. So what's going on? 1 over n gets out, gives me, uh, it gives me uh, 1 over n squared. 
Uh, Laplacian f gets out and gives me Laplacian f squared. But then I have the norm of g, so this is the norm of the identity matrix, more or less, so that's n, so I'm, I'm stuck with 1 over n here. And for some reason, which will uh, become apparent afterwards, I'll use for one of the Laplace f terms that appear here, I'll use that Laplace f is minus lambda times f. So minus 1 over m lambda f Laplace f. OK. Now I put that back in my uh, lower bound. So lambda integral of gradient f squared dvg will be greater than, so maybe we can give a name to that guy. So that would be Hessian zero, let's say. The trace-free trace part of the Hessian. So integral of trace-free part of the Hessian squared over m dvg. And now what are we doing with that? Well, first let's write it. Minus 1 over n lambda integral of f. And I will uh, write that as the divergence of the gradient of f dvg. And to go to the next line, so I will integrate by part, so I will put this divergence here that will give me a gradient and that will play nicely. Oh, I forgot the part of the inequality that comes from the, and I actually forgot it here. So here it's, ah no, it's here, okay. So maybe, let me put the n minus one on the other side. So lambda minus n minus one. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I integrate by part. I get plus 1 over n lambda integral of gradient f squared. Okay, and I put all this part here. And that will get me uh, something here. So, lambda minus so 1 minus 1 over n minus n minus 1 times the integral of gradient f squared dvg uh, is greater than the integral of the trace-free part of the Hessian. Okay, so we know that this guy here has to be greater than zero. So this is greater than zero. Okay, now, so lambda is greater than n. And if lambda is equal to n, so if n is an eigenvalue, then this guy has to be zero. Okay. Uh, so then Laplace f here will be minus n times f. So this Hessian f plus f times g is equal to zero. OK, and that actually implies that uh, m is a sphere. So maybe a quick thing about that. Uh, first thing, so if you compute x, so exercise, times, so you differentiate f plus f squared in the direction of any vector field x, you will get 0. So this is equal, this quantity is constant. So you can scale if you want. And you will get that gradient f squared plus f squared 
is equal to 1. Okay? Uh, okay, so f prime squared plus f squared equal to 1. Well, let's set u such that. So, and this is not a wild guess. I don't have time to do that, but this comes from the inspection of what's going on on the sphere, but n of this formula. And so I set u such that uh, f is equal to the cosine of u. Okay, uh, notice that with this formula, the maximum of f has to be 1, and the minimum of f has to be minus 1. Okay? Uh, if p is uh, such that so f of p is equal to 1, equal to the max of f, then at that point, if, you start, if we start with that, uh, we have that a, the Hessian of f, so the gradient is 0, the Hessian of f has to be uh, so as to be minus the metric and uh, yeah so if you look at the Taylor series near this point you will see that so near P uh, F of Q let's say is equivalent so I'm being a bit sloppy here to 1 minus 1 half of dpq squared. So or r squared in normal coordinates around p. Um, OK. Now, if I set, uh, ah, yeah, I've defined my u here. u satisfies. So u satisfies, uh, it is a distance function, and it also satisfies the following thing, that u is actually equivalent, u of q is actually equivalent to uh, dpq when uh, near p. And I won't do the computation, but you can compute the Hessian of u explicitly from that. You can, and with what we know, so, so here it's a distance function, so we can say that, um, <coughs> so around p we will have the following expansion. So g will look like, let's use that as a new coordinate, du squared plus some metric h of u, and since it is equivalent to the distance function here, h u, in some sense, will be equivalent to r squared times g s n minus 1. So this will be near p. Now, if you take this relation on the action, you will see that this gives you some ODE on HU along every geodesic, which is an integral curve of U. And you can solve that, and you get that G is actually DU squared plus sine U squared G SN minus 1. Then you need to do a little bit of patching to see that that holds on the whole manifold and not just on the neighborhood of P, but that's basically the proof. Okay, so why did I do this proof? It's to show you that when you have good control on the Hessian, so that's actually really good control, then you can say a lot about the geometry, and that will be one of the main tools in the sequel. And the Buckner formula, so is it still here? Yeah, there. Tells you that if, for instance, assume f is harmonic. 
So if f is a harmonic map, uh, assume you know some stuff about the gradient of f. Assume you know some stuff about uh, the Ricci curvature, then you will get some control on the Hessian. Uh, that, usually, that usually will be not that great control. Most of the time, only integral control. But that tells you kind of why this circle of ideas should lead to something. OK. And why we will be so interested at some point in by Hessian estimates. OK, now let's move on to the uh, second part of the lectures, which is chromov hausdorff convergence. Uh, any question on the first part of the lecture? So if you have something that is really bothering you on the gradient or the divergence, it's time to say it. OK. Uh, OK, so what is the idea of gromov hausdorff convergence? So we want to make something precise from the following situation. So let's assume that you have a sphere and a sequence of sphere where the radius go to zero. So you want to be able to say that in the end you get a point in some sense. Uh, another situation. Let's assume that you start with the sphere and you make bigger and bigger spheres. So if you imagine that, and you pick this point at the origin and the sphere on some side in this orientation, what will you see at the end? So you will inflate your sphere like that in the end, it, yeah, like that. So you will get a, a piece, an hyperplane. So this goes to more or less Rn. And actually, if you think a little bit about that, you can play that game with any submanifold of Rn. And in fact, you would like to play that game with any manifold, Riemannian manifold, and get when you look when you look at the and this is kind of the 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 idea of Riemannian geometry is that when you look really close, when you zoom a lot, you get the tangent space with its inner product, which is Rn. Okay, maybe another thing that we would like to make precise. So let's consider so the torus, the flat torus. So this is R2 modded out by Z2. And let's consider one of its siblings, so which would be R2 modded out by z plus one half of z, and so on. So these are quotient. So these groups act on R2 by isometries. So they, when you go to the quotient, you get a Riemannian metric, which will be flat. And yeah, you can continue to play this game as long as you want. And at the end, what, you, what should you get? So you can think of your, oh, how do you call that? Well, say a really thin donut. And in the end, you get a circle. Well, in, on an intrinsic level, it's just a line where both hands, where both ends are glued. OK, so we want to get some notion of convergence, which will take care of these three situations, and much more. And we want to be able to um, 
to say something about sequences of metric spaces and actually sequences of Riemannian manifolds. Uh, and that's interesting for several, re several reasons. Um, yeah, that, uh, maybe I'll mention that later. But yeah, let's say it's interesting. Hope you believe me. Uh, OK, so definition of Gromov Hausdorff distance. OK, so there are several ways to define the Gromov Hausdorff distance. First, let x dx and y dy be compact metric spaces. And f sum map from x to y. Actually, it could even be something. So I don't require anything on the map f. Might be discontinuous. Might be continuous or smooth, but I don't ask anything. And I define the following quantity. So this is called the distortion of f. And so, so, so this is equal to the max of all x and x prime uh, in x times x of the following quantity. So you look at how far apart were these two points. So d of x, so d inside x of x, x prime. And you also, and you see, so they have moved by f. They are somewhere in y. I can compute their distance. And you look how different is this distance from the original one. OK. Now I can define the gromov hausdorff distance. So definition. Okay. So the Gromov Hausdorff distance between two compact metric spaces X and Y <coughs> is the infimum of uh, all F from X to Y and all. Uh, should I call that G? Yeah, I guess that's one. And G from Y to X. Uh, OK, such that. So yeah, we I add another condition here. Um, so F of X is epsilon dense in y. What I mean by that is that every point in y is at distance at most epsilon from a point in f of x. And g of y is the same. And of, well, the set of all this distortion of f and distortion of G. Okay, 
So yeah, maybe I should give reference for this part. Uh, well, I guess my favorite reference is the book. So yeah, I won't give much proof in this part. And there are, if you're not familiar with the subject, they might be hard to come by by yourself at first. So for the proofs, I recommend you to have a look at uh, the book. A course in metric geometry. Which is actually available at the library here, if I recall correctly. By Burago. Burago. Well, let's put a squared. And Ivanov. OK. Uh, so, OK, so that's. So yeah, one of the proof is that that's actually a distance. So the fact that it's symmetric is OK. The, with this definition, the, I guess the triangle inequality might not be that easy, but it's not that bad, I guess. Uh, and well, what happens? Yeah. Ah, OK. Mm. Yeah, ah, OK. I th so I was puzzled, but there was a good reason to that. And I'll explain it to you now. I skipped one definition because I was too much in a hurry. And <coughs> that's what made it, uh, yeah. I agree that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Uh, Just change the way I defined it <laughs> from last time. Uh, let me check it out. Yeah. OK, let's forget that, actually. <laughs> Sorry. I'm not sure if I can fix that in finite time, so I restart with the right definition, sorry. Uh, OK, so distortion is still there. That's interesting. So definition, so f from y, from x to y is, so yeah, an epsilon approximation. If the following hold, so first, the distortion of f is less than epsilon, and two, uh, so f of x is epsilon dense in y. OK. Uh, and now I can define the Gromov-Hausdorff distance in a correct way, at least. So definition, so the Gromov-Hausdorff distance from x to y is equal to the infimum of all the epsilon positive such that there exists some epsilon approximation from x to y and there exists some epsilon approximation from y to x. OK, that's the right definition. Uh, so maybe let's look. So n uh, definition. So well, once you have a so yeah, there was something I needed to say. So what happens if the, dis the gromov hausdorff distance between two metric spaces uh, is zero? So it's obviously an isometry invariant. If you have an isometry from x to y, it will be an epsilon approximation for every epsilon. 
So this is not a distance on the set of metric spaces, compact metric spaces. This is a distance on the set of compact metric spaces modded out by isometry. Okay? And you could actually prove then that when you have a sequence of epsilon approximation where epsilon goes to zero between two fixed metric spaces, then at the end you can get an isometry. Okay. Um, so now that we have a distance, we can talk about converging sequence and stuff like that. So we need to say that something converge to some limit, some sequence converge to some limit, finer and finer epsilon approximation. And so here, maybe it's really visual in that example, what's going on, what would be my approximation would be to put everyone here. So here, when I do that, I make an error of one half. Here, my error is one fourth. This is some map from the torus to the circle. So I didn't really say what's going on here because you have two choices. Pick your side and even pick in a, some non-measurable way your side if you want. That doesn't matter. And so this will be your sequence of epsilon approximation. And if you want to do it the other way around, well, you just pick something like that and push that here. So here, the epsilon approximation uh, are really stupid. You just map everyone. So this would be my, so there will be some epsilon approximation for each member of the sequence. So F1, F2, F3. So you map everything to the limit. And here you pick some point to get the epsilon approximation the other way around. So actually picking that, uh, so in this definition, I would have got the same converging sequences if I put only f. But to get a real distance which is symmetric, it's better to put the f and the g. And the g. But in application, usually you only build f when you want to prove convergence of some sequences. OK. Um, maybe last definition for today, and I'll concentrate on examples afterwards. Uh, so yeah, so this example and this examples, we know that they are, they are doing what we want them to do. They are converging to the limit we expected. So now, what about this one? Well, here, so basically it's, uh, so, Grover-Forsdorf convergence is some kind of uniform convergence of function. When you look at the, well, assume your epsilon approximation, assume x is y, you have two distances, and your epsilon approximation is the identity, then the distortion of f will just be the uniform like the norm of d1 minus d2 as function defined on x times x. So yeah, that's some kind of uniform convergence. Yeah, that's pretty clear from here, if f is the identity. So, uh, but when you have function defined on a non-compact space, uniform convergence is usually way too strong. And what you want is Something like uniform convergence on every compact set or stuff like that. There's a way to do that. Uh, but you, you don't have a, between x and y, you don't have a good way to put every compact of x inside y and so on. So we need to like fix some point. 
Basically, the, the thing is to avoid the following stuff. OK, consider that. Assume you have some cylindrical n here. And here it's some plane. Glue that this way. So I want to look at what's going on when I look at that from far, 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 far away. So if I go really far away in that direction, what will I see? Well, I'll see a cylinder. And if I go far away in that direction, what will I see? Well, I'll see a plane. So you need to fix some base points to talk about convergence of non-compact spaces. And this is what we will do. So, so I could give a simple wrong definition, which I thought was the right one for some time. Uh, but instead, I'll give a not so complicated right definition. So basically, the idea that you want to have is you have a sequence of pointed metric spaces, x dx and x0. So that guy is some point in x. And y, dy, and y0. Well, that guy, uh, yeah, I will do that for sequence. So I'll put i's everywhere. Uh, OK xi, dxi, and x not i. And I want that to converge, sorry, to x dx x not. OK. Uh, basically, what you want to say is that if I take some ball of radius r, so we'll assume that all those metric spaces are relatively compact for simplicity. But, well, actually, that doesn't, it's not really important. Oh, well, a little bit. So, assume that you have a ball of radius r here. You want it to around your base point. So you have this sequence of ball, which are compact metric spaces. You want it to Gromov-Hausdorff converge to the ball of radius r around that point. And for every uh, so for every r, you want this convergence to happen. So we could say that, but actually that's not quite the right definition. Uh, there are examples which satisfy that, this kind of convergence, but where the limit is not unique. So you need to fix some stuff, and this is what's going on in that definition. Uh, OK. So. I will say that this gromov hausdorff maybe pointed gromov hausdorff converge as i go to infinity uh, if the following hold. So for every r positive, so this will be some kind of radius. For every epsilon positive, so this is our frame from here, uh, we have the following. So yeah. There exists some f from b. So the ball of center xi not. Did I put that in that direction? Yeah. Not radius r into x. So this is some guy in xi with. So first, the distortion of f is less than epsilon. Second, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 
f of b x i x i not r so it contains uh, b which b b x of p well not p of x not r minus epsilon uh, third so f of that same guy is epsilon dense in uh, b x x not r and fourth Uh, well, you want that to respect the choice of point you met, you make here. So yeah, those are fi's, they depend on i. Uh, and I'm missing some quantifier. So for every r and for every epsilon, there exists some big N, such that for any i bigger than big N, this holds. So fi of xi not is equal to x dot. So that's kind of a complicated definition, but the idea should be the one I told you. Like every ball of radius r, yeah? Uh, in length spaces, yes. But I guess that when you are, yeah, sometimes, so what could go wrong? So there are some pretty complicated examples, but there are pretty simple ones too. Uh, consider So, just to see that we need can, well, at least that there is something to be done on that part and also on that. Well, that part is more complicated, but there is something to be done here. So set, consider Z, but scale it but by one minus one or plus. Uh, Plus. So scale it like that. So you want it to converge to uh, Z. Now if you look, so if you look at the definition, actually you will be able to say that this Kromov-Hausdorff converges to Z. However, if you look at the ball, so let xi, at the ball in xi of radius uh, around, let's say, zero. Well, yeah, I need a pointing here, but these are really totally translation invariant, so that doesn't matter. So if you look at that, in each of those metric space, the ball around the origin of radius one, well, closed ball, open ball, whatever you want, it's just zero. And it will never converge to the ball, the closed ball in x, so this is x, of radius one, which is zero minus one, one. So you need this kind of wiggling to be able to get that kind of stuff. Okay. And you could do something the, the other way around too. Okay, now let's give examples and lots of examples. So first, let's see what's going on with surfaces. So,
So we have seen two examples that I raised not too long ago. Um, so the ball shrinks to a point. Let's maybe try to think of what's going on with curvature in that case. So the curvature of a ball of radius r is 1 over r squared. So the curvature blows up, but nonetheless remains non-negative and positive, actually. OK, so that's one example. Uh, yeah. So that goes to a point, and so curvature here is bounded from below. Uh, when we look at our torus, going to a circle, okay, we could do that. Or actually, I can also do the same thing, like just scaling. Oh, no, that's not a torus anymore. Okay, uh, yeah, smaller and smaller, and I could go to a point. So here, so these are flat. So when you rescale some directions and stuff like that, you remain flat. So the curvature is zero, uh, but that's a really specific example. Say that here the curvature is bounded. And it shrinks to a point or a circle. Um, OK, and yeah, that's two examples. Uh, maybe, so to, to what kind of spaces could we go, like starting on a sphere and going to something of a lower dimension? Well, you can actually, so take something like a segment in R3 and take the boundary of a tubular neighborhood. Maybe smooth it out a little bit. That will be some convex set and shrink it. You will go to the segment. So we could also have here that, 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 and that some segment. So, and actually, when you try to make those kind of stuff, so if you start with an hyperbolic surface, so believe me, this has a curvature minus one everywhere, you can shrink it too and go to a point, but there will be no uh, lower curvature bound. So, in some sense, that's reminiscent of a Silva rough classification of manifolds into big. So, big manifolds, you cannot collapse them with a lower, a lower curvature bound. Medium-sized manifold, you can collapse them with two-sided curvature bound. And big manifold, you might collapse them. Well, it depends. You can collapse them, but we, you, will lose the upper you, you will lose the upper curvature bound. So when you lose dimension here, so things can go really wild, uh, as in this example. So things can go bad in only one direction, as in this example, these two examples. Or at the curvature level, things can stay pretty OK. Uh, and <coughs> OK. So, well, let's, let's switch to uh, examples in three dimensions.
So since I'm focused on uh, Ricci curvature here, and upper bound on Ricci curvature are not that interesting, I will, most of what I will say will kind of try to deal with that kind of collapsing. This kind, I will give an example, and maybe uh, state some kind of theorem on that, and this I will not deal with. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, so that's example of collapsing. Maybe I should give example of what's going on. So what's going on when you're not collapsing? So, so not collapsing is converging to something with the same uh, topology. And usually it's interesting. So you can do a lot of stuff, but when you don't put any curvature bounds, it's so thing can go really, really bad. So we're interested usually with collapsing with non-collapsing or collapsing with curvature bounds. Um, let's look at so something which looks like that. So let's take the following uh, space. So we have a spherical cap, a cylinder, and some kind of the, the same spherical cap on the bottom. So here the curvature is 1, here the curvature is 0, here the curvature is 1. So this kind of surface does not admit a smooth Riemannian metric because if the metric is C2, the curvature is a C0 function. So here it's discontinuous. Uh, nevertheless, it's C1, 1. So it's a C1, 1 surface from a Riemannian geometric point of view. Uh, OK. So and actually, I can approach, approach that with smooth surface. So, well, I guess you can do the picture like that. And yeah, here it's still smooth, but in the end, you lose a little bit of smoothness. And if you concentrate a little bit, here we have bounded curvature. OK. Uh, and actually, this is kind of a prototypical situation, which says that if you're converging with bounded curvature and with some kind of non-collapsing assumption, like a lower bound on the volume and let's say an upper bound on the diameter, then you will converge to some C1 alpha Riemannian metric. That's chigurh gromov uh, com compactness theorem. So, yeah, that's a prototype of Chigurh-Gromov of convergence, compactness. OK, and that's bounded curvature, more or less. Bounded curvature and no collapsing. So the, yeah. OK, so what could go, could things go really wrong if you just ask for a lower bound on the curvature? How wrong could things go? So, well. So maybe the best example is the following one. So and a bound on the curvature is a C2 bound, more or less, and you get C11 convergence. So that's some kind of Ascoli theorem and stuff like that. And if I only have if I only control the second derivative in one direction. So which would be a one-sided bound, and actually 
quite often a lower bound on the curvature. Then, well, so you know that when you go past to the limit on a sequence of convex function, you, things remain convex. But uh, you might lose differentiability quite a bit. The limit will still be convex, so differentiable almost everywhere and stuff like that. But you can lose stuff. And here is an example of that phenomenon that will give us a really nice example on surfaces afterwards. So OK. So I could actually write an explicit formula for that in terms of square root and stuff like that. So that's some convex, smooth convex function, which develops a singularity at the origin along this sequence of smooth convex function. And now I can turn, out, turn this into an example of surfaces. So I take the surface of revolution around that stuff. And I will converge to a cone. So the cone is perfectly flat outside of the tip. But you cannot get uh, even a C0 Riemannian metric through the tip of the cone. The best you can do is get a Riemannian metric in some Sobolev spaces, stuff like that. Uh, but, and the reason is that here, at the curvature level, uh, you, you have some like, really concentrated curvature, which is quite natural to require from that. OK. So, uh, okay. so let's try to see what's going on with 3D examples. So, and it's actually a hard matter in Riemannian geometry to build examples. And there are really few tools to, to do that. So, <clears throat> so and usually writing the metric in coordinate like really hands-on stuff, it's not a really good way to build examples. So, uh, 3D examples. Okay, so... So first... Think about 3D Lie groups, and actually two of them, really precisely, with left invariant metrics. So that means that you have your Lie group acting on itself. You say what the what the metric is at the, on the tangent space to the identity, and you propagate it by left translation. That gives you a Riemannian metric. And actually, the, so using the properties of the connection and the fact that when you have a Lie group, you can compute Lie bracket really efficiently, you can compute the connection on the left invariant vector fields pretty easily, and you can compute the curvature. It's uh, something which requires training, which you probably should try if you've never done it. Uh, but that gives really nice examples. So, first case will be the following. Uh, so, let me start with S3. So, it's the only sphere except S1 that is a Lie group, but that's kind of a blessing because we can do a lot of things here. I will look at that as sitting in, well, not even in C2, but in quaternions. There are, there's a lot of way to look at S3 as a Lie group. So some like to see it as SU2, the group of uh, uh, Hermitian, no, what's the name? Uh, Hermitian? What? Unitary. unitary. Special group of, the group of unitary 2 by 2 by matrices with determinant 1. 
You can also look at that as the unit sphere in the screw field of quaternions. And that's kind of the way I, I prefer it. So we have here what is, so one, so this is equal to the set of Q in H such that Q, Q bar, which as for complex number is uh, the norm, so is equal to one. So you have to the tangent, uh, the tangent space at one to S3 is the set of purely imaginary uh, quaternion. It's a 3D space, okay? So A, B, C in R3. And if I take I, J, K as a basis of this tangent space, then I can see that as uh, I can uh, move these vectors along to get a left invariant vector field, which I will denote by, so, I, J, K, left translation. will go to x, y, and z. So vect left invariant vector field. And when you compute uh, the Lie bracket here, it's the same as the Lie bracket in, SEO, in SO3, SU2, and so on. So you have this really nice symmetric, really symmetrically algebra knocking around. And so I can define an inner product on the Lie algebra by just saying what it does on these guys, and it will give me a, an inner product, a Riemannian metric on the whole manifold. And okay, I will call that metric GT uh, the Riemannian metric. such that so y and z have norm 1, x has norm t, and uh, lastly, well, x, y, z are orthogonal. So what are the, the orbits of this X vector field? So if you think a little bit about that, you will see that it acts. So orbits of X, or maybe there's a left or a right thing that I'm not sure about. So it's T. So that, that's the flow. I will write the whole flow map. So it acts by left multiplication by a complex number of modulus one. So what are the orbits here? So they are the intersection of H with complex subspaces. So these are the fiber of the hop vibration. Uh, and what does this metric do? So you are shrinking the fibers of the hop vibration. So maybe, I don't think I'll have time to write it down, but the hop vibration, so you have these fibers, this S1, and you get a fiber bundle over S2. So you have S3, this circle, you collapse them, and you can do that, so that when you have collapsed all the fibers, you get S2. Uh, and so I wrote this on my notes. You can make it very explicit with quaternions and stuff like that. That works brilliantly. Uh, so, and this hop, this hop map will play really well with this uh, Riemannian metric. 
will be a Riemannian submersion with totally geodesic fibers. So in particular, um, you will get some information on the curvature. Okay. Uh, so I computed the curvature. I hope I didn't make mis mistake. You so there is no magic for that, I guess. I mean, if you know some, just tell me. Uh, you start with that. You use, uh, for instance, Kotsul formula. Or you do that by randomly differentiating the stuff to get some information on the Levi-Civita connection. And you compute the Levi-Civita connection. Then you compute the curvature. And let's see what's going on. So, so I will write that in terms of sectional curvature. So each plane has a sectional curvature, which is R of E1, E2, E1, E2. And we will see what this gets. So sectional curvature is usually denoted by T. And this depends only on the plane generated by two guys. OK. So K of this guy is equal to K of x, z. Hmm, really? OK. And will be equal to t squared if I didn't mess that up. Uh, and so g, t. And k of y, z will be equal to 4 minus 3t squared. So the curvature is bounded here when t ranges, let's say, from 0 to 1. And we get the, the following thing. Um, so fact, and this is what I was telling you, as t goes to 0, uh, S3 with the metric G, uh, GT, gromov hausdorff converges to a sphere of radius 1 half. And so yeah, as I told you, with this Riemannian submersion and those fibers and those maps, you can really see what's going on pretty clearly. And the uh, gromov hausdorff so the length of the fibers of this submersion is shrinking along when t goes to 0. So, uh, so they are getting closer and closer to being epsilon approximation. So if you make an error of the order, the length of the fiber, that doesn't count in gromov hausdorff convergence. So, so you get that. So OK, that's an interesting example. There's another one built from the same idea, and maybe I'll stop there from now. Uh, OK. So consider the following. So let P be some prime number. And consider the map, the action of Z over PZ on S3, which is given by so k dot some point uh, p in S3 is equal to e to the 2, the i 2 pi k over p, yeah, times, ah, oh, I have 2p, so that will be a q, times q. So this is a perfectly nice action, and it acts by isometry on S3. So when you take the quotient, so this will be some kind of length space, LP. Maybe Sylvain will talk to you a little bit about them uh, this afternoon. Uh, so that will be S3 quotiented by this Z mod PZ. 
this action of Z mod PZ. So what does it do? Well, it kind of acts in the same way as this metric in that it shrinks the, hop, the fibers of the hop vibrations. And here, so I guess it will converge to an S2. I don't remember if it's smooth. Is it a smooth S2? Or if it has some conical singularities somewhere? OK, well, that goes uh, to some S2. I didn't prepare this example. OK, so I guess that's our last example for today. So I'm this on collapsing with bounded curvature to something lower dimensional. Uh, this afternoon, we'll see a third uh, a new three-dimensional three example, which uh, is collapsing to a point of a three-dimensional manifold. So we could do that with T3, but we'll see that there is a more twisted way to do that. And uh, well, that will be all for this morning. Thank you. <laughs>